Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game Core. Today we're gonna to do a final review of this device here. This is the Ambernic RG405M. And this device is similar to other Ambernic handhelds that have been released over the years with a couple key differences. Number one, it has a four inch display here with the same common four by three aspect ratio they use on their other devices, just a little bit larger. And that difference is kind of significant when actually playing. Secondly, they finally made a device that is both small and very powerful. This is kind of the best of the best for me. I want something very pocketable, but also has a good amount of power to it as well. This is finally the Ambernic device that does that. In fact, I think this might be the best retro handheld that Ambernic has released to date. However, I'm not really sure if it's the one you should be buying. And that's really going to be the subject matter of this review here. We're gonna take a look at all the features and functionality of the Ambernic RG405M, but at the same time, I wanna make sure it's the best fit for you and your specific use case. Now, I've already done an impressions video. I'll have it linked down below. And in that video, I went over things like the button feel and all that kind of stuff. In this video here, we're gonna mostly focus on whether or not it's worth buying. And to get that done, we're gonna take a new approach. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna give you five Five reasons of why I think the Ambernic is a very, very good device, and then three reasons why you may want to skip it. Now, as you'll see near the end of the video, I do recommend this device, but you do need to know what you're getting into before you buy it, because there are other options out in the market, especially nowadays when everything is just very saturated with choice. Either way, I had a lot of fun putting this together, and I think you'll enjoy watching it too. And so without any further delay, let's jump into the review. Okay, the first reason why the Ambernic RG405M is worth considering is its premium build quality. To start, the device is made with an aluminum shell, and it has a very premium feel to it in the hand. Additionally, the components are top-notch as well. Their face buttons have a rubber membrane connection that feel nice and retro, and they're using Hall Sensor analog sticks right here, which means no stick drift, and they have a nice smooth feeling to them too. The D-pad is also one of the best in the business as well. It has a rubber membrane connection, again, much like a retro controller. And it all comes together into a device that just feels really solid in the hand. It has a nice hefty weight to it, but it's also relatively small, and so all the buttons are easy to access as well. I also like the fact that with this device here, they've rounded out the sides to it. It feels a lot more comfortable to cup it into your hands this way. Now, despite having a premium feel to it, the hardware on this device is not perfect. For example, in order to make it more pocketable, they have inline shoulder buttons. And while this does make the device nice and slim, I really do prefer playing with stack shoulder buttons like this. And so personally, I would rather have stack shoulder buttons like on the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus right here. Additionally, in terms of I.O., there's another piece missing right here on the top, and that is an HDMI port. The Retroid Pocket 3 Plus has the exact same chip inside of it, but also has HDMI support. So it's definitely something that was theoretically possible on the 405M, but unfortunately it was left out. One other thing I like about the overall hardware is that the bezels on the screen are relatively thin. As you can see here with a full screen dimension, it takes up a lot of that empty space. And so yes, in a nutshell, I think the 405M has excellent build quality. There are a couple things that I wish were a little bit better, but overall I have no complaints. Now one thing that is unique is that the analog stick is above the D-pad on this device. And initially when I saw it, I thought I wasn't going to like that. But because the device is so small, I found it was a non-issue for me. When it came down to it, I just naturally used either one depending on the game. And really they were both very comfortable. Another thing I like about the RG405M is how thin and portable it is. It's definitely a handheld that I would classify as being a smaller device, and I think the overall proportions on it are really well made. Plus, the benefit of having those inline shoulder buttons means that it's going to be very pocketable. In fact, I can just kind of throw it in and out of my pocket with ease. Now, because it's made out of metal, it is a little bit hefty. For example, it's 260 grams or a little bit over a half pound. So I would say it's a little bit heavier than your standard phone. Either way, over the past couple weeks, I've been taking the device with me wherever I go. It could be a little trip to the store or a longer trip. And I think that says a lot about how nice and portable it is, because no matter what the situation is, it just seems to be a good fit. And so the way I see it, if you're comfortable with walking around with a phone, you'll be comfortable with this one too. Up next, we're gonna talk about the four inch screen within the RG405M. And this is the first time I've seen a four inch screen like this in a retro handheld. And so we're gonna spend a lot of time digging into it right here. To start, one of my favorite things is that the device is not that much larger than the previous generation devices with three and a half inch screens. But as you can see, that half inch does make quite a difference in overall size between the two. And so it's a bit of a win-win scenario. We have a bigger screen to be able to see things more easily, but also the device is not that much larger than the others. 
In fact, with 16 by 9 aspect ratio devices like the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus right here, you can see that when showing 4x3 content, it's about the exact same size. But all the same, with a 4x3 aspect ratio, we have the benefit of having a smaller device overall. Another comparison here would be the Ambernic RG505. This one has the same chip inside, but with a 16x9 aspect ratio display. And as you can see here, this device is quite a bit larger than the 405M. In fact, in just about all respects, I would rather play on the 405M than the 505, especially when it comes to 4x3 content. Now previously, Ambernic had released a device that was kind of large, but had a very good screen for 4x3 content. And it's this one here, the Ambernic RG552. This one has a unique 5x3 aspect ratio display and a high resolution as well. And thanks to that higher resolution, we can get about 4.5 inches with 4x3 content, and this is with integer scaling on. If we wanted to turn that off to take up the full screen, it would get even larger. And if we're only comparing screens, then I do prefer the one on the RG552. That higher resolution means a lot to me. It allows me to do integer scaling for games like this, and that gives me a very sharp and crisp experience. We'll talk more about that when we get into pixel density here in a second. At this point, we're still talking about size. So let's talk about another larger device, the Odin Lite, which has a 16 by 9 aspect ratio screen that is 6 inches in length. That will give us 4x3 content that's about 5 inches, so quite a bit larger than the 405M, but of course the device itself is quite a bit bigger as well. For me, when it comes to 4x3 content, specifically on a smaller device, I would prefer to use the RG405M over any of these others. Yes, I would say the Ambernic RG552 has a better screen, and the Odin one is certainly larger as well, but I wouldn't feel comfortable throwing either of those devices in my pocket and running around town. And so if that's important to you, I think the 405M is definitely going to be worth considering consideration. Now when you're talking outside of 4x3 content, that is where the RG405M is going to fall a little bit short. For example, the aspect ratio on the RG552 really lends itself to Game Boy Advance. In fact, this is with integer scaling right here, and it's just about perfect. And so if you are looking to play 3x2 content, like the Game Boy Advance, I would say the 552 will probably be an overall better experience. And the same is going to go for 16x9 content, especially PSP. The Ambernic RG505 actually uses a PS Vita OLED display, which is going to give you a 2x resolution of PSP content. And because of that, PSP games are just going to look a lot better and bigger on the 505. And the games will play just fine on the 405M, as I'll show later, but by comparison, having to squish down to a 16x9 aspect ratio on a 4x3 display does make it quite small. And the same is going to happen with any other 16x9 content. For example, if you want to try to play Nintendo Switch games on here, yes, there are going to be a few games that are possible to play on this device, but all the same, it's going to be a very small and squinty experience. Similarly, there are going to be retro games that can be extended using widescreen hacks to take up a 16x9 aspect ratio display. And Dreamcast is going to be a great example right here. To me, it really comes down to what you prefer. Do you want to play these games in their original aspect ratio to kind of recreate that gaming past? Or would you rather play something that's very similar to like a remastered version instead? So if you do want to have widescreen versions of your original games, then I think something like the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus will be a better bet over the 405M. After all, these use the exact same chip, and so performance should be just about the same. Now earlier I mentioned pixel density, and that is one place where the 405M isn't quite great. As you can see right here on the screen, the pixel density is 228.57 pixels per inches. And that's a pretty low resolution when you compare it to other devices in the same price point. For example, the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus has a PPI of 325.61. So that's nearly 100 pixels per inch larger. Also, thanks to having a higher resolution, that means you can upscale PSP games to a 3x resolution instead of 2. That means your upscaled content, like PSP, Dreamcast, Nintendo 64, is going to look a lot sharper on this display than it will on the 405M. And when it comes to playing pixel games, like on the Super Nintendo, you can kind of tell the difference in sharpness as well. If you're looking for very crisp pixels on your sprites, you're not really going to see that on the 405M. In fact, it's a very similar experience to the 505, which is the only device in this price category that has a lower pixel per inch density. When you compare either of these devices against something like the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus, I think it's night and day in terms of clarity and crispness. And it's an even more stark contrast with the RG552, which almost has double the pixels per inch. And again, this is running with integer scaling on. Even smaller devices like the Mio Mini will actually look a little bit sharper too, because even though it has the same resolution, it's on a smaller display. 
So what this really means is that yes, you won't have these perfectly crisp pixels when you're playing the 405M. In fact, the pixels will be even a little bit more chunky than they were on a three and a half inch device. But I found that after testing for a couple weeks, I didn't really mind that anymore. In fact, it just kind of gave me a bit of a more authentic experience. I think that if having very crisp pixels is important to you, then the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus will be an upgrade in that regard. And I would say the RG552 here is probably going to be the best device overall for that specific use. And I've actually made an entire video talking about this idea. When it comes down to it, if I'm only going to be playing 16-bit and 8-bit games, things like Super Nintendo, Genesis, Nintendo, or even Game Boy Advance, then yes, I think the RG552 gives you the best experience overall. However, if you want to play anything but those systems, then the 552 is not going to be a good fit. In the end, if I compare all these devices side by side, then yes, I can see where the 405M has a low resolution display. But in actual practical use, I ended up really liking that overall experience. In fact, I started to kind of lean into the idea of playing something that's just a little bit chunkier. And if you really want to get into it, you could get a shader that gives you a CRT effect as well. I found that this ended up being a very enjoyable experience too. In the end, it's not the most pixel pure experience, but it's still a lot of fun, especially on this 4 inch display. Now, having a lower resolution display like this also comes into play when you're doing just regular things like web browsing. It's a lot like going back to an old iPad after having a new one for a long time. And so if you want to have really nice and sharp text, then yeah, the 405M is not going to be great in that regard. And something with a higher resolution display like the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus will just look a lot crisper overall. But you're likely going to be spending most of your time playing games and not actually browsing the web, so this is kind of minor overall. And finally, while I have you here talking about the screen, let's talk about some of the other factors. We'll start with the lowest and highest brightness. And as you can see, with the lowest brightness, the 405M is quite dim. And that'll be great when playing games in a very low light. However, overall, I would say that this screen is just very naturally dim. For example, to play the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus in a comfortable light, I usually go about 25% overall. To get a similar experience with the RG405M, I found myself going somewhere between 75 and 80% brightness. And so naturally, the Ambernix screen is just relatively more dim. If you try to go up to full brightness on both the devices, it becomes very apparent. It's kind of hard to pick up on my camera here, but I would say the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus in max brightness is almost twice as bright as the 405M. So if you want to play in a bright condition environment, like playing outdoors, I don't think the 405M is going to be a very good fit for that. Now, going back to just a standard level of brightness right here, let's do a comparison of color balance as well as temperature. And I think it's pretty apparent right here, the 405M is a little bit on the cooler side, and I would say the tint here skews just a tiny little bit to green more than red. However, in the end, I think it's a pretty nice balance, it's just that the white is not quite as white as I would like. So depending on your preference, whether or not you like a warm or a cool screen, this might be important to you. All right, the next thing I like about this device is that it is relatively easy to use once you've set it up. For example, here's my test unit after I've gone through and installed everything and made it all pretty. And as you can see, I can navigate through my systems with these shoulder buttons, and then I can jump into any of these systems, navigate through the games, and all while seeing this really pretty box art too. From there, I can pick my game, it'll start right up, and after everything initializes, I'm able to just start playing my game like that. I've also set up my hotkeys so that when I'm done playing, I'll press select and start at the same time, and it'll bring me back to this menu. And so essentially, I can use the controller to navigate through everything I'd like. And this front end called Daijisho is great because it allows you to set up widgets as well. Additionally, you have an apps tab, so you can just jump into your apps right here. And same thing with the settings tab, so you can jump into any of those settings if you need to as well. And I'm not going to get too far in the weeds when it comes to setting this device up here because I've already made a starter guide for Android emulation. I'll leave this link below, but it's on my website as well. Additionally, I've also made a Daijisho front end guide, so you can have it looking nice and pretty too. Regardless, if you spend a couple hours getting this all set up, you'll have a really nice gaming experience after that. Now, Ambernic also has pre installed their own front end. To access that, you would swipe down from the top, and then you would tap this little button here on the bottom left. And this is their front end right here. And to be honest, I didn't really spend the time getting this set up, mostly because I didn't really find it to be a very intuitive experience. As much as I appreciate that Ambernix trying to make an all-in-one solution when it comes to navigating through your games, I personally think that manually setting things up and then using Daijisho is going to give you a better experience overall. But if you are interested in trying to figure this one out, I think Ambernix has made a couple setup videos of their own. Now, one thing I do want to show when getting set up is how to get retro games to look their best. Using the Mega Man X Life Bar right here, you can see 
that the pixels are not perfectly balanced. If they were, each of these lines would look symmetrical. And there's a couple ways to fix that. I'm going to jump into the RetroArch menu here and go into video settings. Here I can set integer scaling. This is going to balance out those pixels perfectly, but it is going to make the screen a little bit smaller. And actually on this display, the additional borders are not that bad at all. And so if you want to play with integer scaling, I think it's absolutely doable with systems like Nintendo and Super Nintendo. Another way to work around this is to use either filters or shaders. We're going to do shaders here in this video. These you can find under the RetroArch quick menu once you start up a game. And I recommend going into the GLSL shaders and then interpolation. Within here, there are two good options. There's the pixelate shader as well as the sharp bilinear 2x prescale. And both of these work pretty well, but we're going to use the pixelate one because I think it's a little bit sharper. And so after applying that shader, looking back at the life bar, you can see now it's nice and balanced and is taking up the full screen. It looks very good. So if you're happy with that, I would recommend going back into the quick menu and into shaders and then go into save and save core preset. That means anytime you open up a Super Nintendo game, it's going to have these nice pixels. And you can do the same thing with the other systems like Genesis and Nintendo. They're all going to look great. And that's what I did for the rest of the testing in this video. Either way, once you have it all set up, I do think that this interface is going to work out really well. It might take some time to get acquainted with how everything works in terms of the emulators and everything else, but once you have it down, it's a pretty seamless experience. Now there is one weird bug within the Ambernic Android build, and that is that it won't save your Xbox style buttons when you restart the device. So after every restart, what you need to do is swipe down from the top and then toggle on this Xbox mode right here. After you've turned it off then on, it's going to work out just fine, but you have to remember to do that every time you start the device up. And really that hasn't been a big deal for me because I usually just keep this device in sleep mode. And that's actually one of my favorite things about this device is that the sleep mode works really well. It kind of functions like a tablet or phone. So you tap on the power button to close it and then tap it again to bring it back up. And the battery life on this device is good. You can get at least eight hours of gameplay time with it. And so because of that, you only really need to charge it every couple days anyway. And so I found the overall experience is pretty good when using it in sleep mode only. Okay, now let's talk about the fifth reason why I think the 405M is worth your consideration, and that's going to be your overall experience when retro gaming. And a lot of this comes down to a combination of all the other features we've already talked about. Yes, we have that nice 4-inch screen which has a 4x3 aspect ratio display, but we also have those premium buttons and D-pad and a smaller overall size too. When you combine all those things together, specifically when you're playing retro games, it's just a really great experience. So when it comes to playing old school handheld systems like Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, yeah, all these are going to be great. But I think this handheld really shines when playing 4x3 systems. So all the favorite systems from my childhood, Nintendo, Sega Genesis, Super Nintendo, these are all going to look really good. And as a reminder, I'm using that pixelate shader to balance all the pixels. And like I mentioned earlier, yes, the screen is kind of low resolution and so everything's going to feel a little bit chunky. But again, I kind of don't mind that, especially when playing these older pixel retro games. Now there's a lot of different handhelds that can also play these systems, but as far as I know, there's none that can play them on a 4 inch display with a native 4x3 aspect ratio. And this difference, although slight, does make it feel very good to play these systems. And of course this can apply to many other systems, so for example old school computer games usually had a 4x3 aspect ratio as well. So if you want to play some of these older point and click adventures, this is going to be a lot of fun too. And because the 405M has a pretty powerful chip, that means you can run heavyweight shaders if you'd like as well. For me personally, I really liked using a CRT shader when playing horizontal arcade games. Things like Final Fight and Michael Jackson's Moonwalker just looked really fun. I also found that by having a slightly larger 4x3 screen like this, playing vertical games was pretty good too. Usually what I will do is flip the screen over on its side and then play the device on its side as well. But I found that the 4 inch screen like this actually made vertical games palatable too. Another system that ran in 4x3 was the Nintendo DS. And because we have a touch screen that means we're going to have full touch screen functionality within the emulator. Now depending on the game you may want to see two screens at once or alternate between the two. And what I've done here is I've set up hotkeys to be able to show both screens at once or be able to flip through them if I'd like. So really depending on the DS game that you're playing this might be a good fit for you too. Now moving on, there are quite a few other systems that had a native 4x3 too. For example, PlayStation 1 is going to look great right here. I'm playing everything at a 2x resolution in RetroArch just to make sure that I'm getting a full 480p display. And these games look really good. You don't need to do any sort of shaders or anything else like that. They're just naturally going to be at that native aspect ratio. So PS1 is going to look great here, but the same thing is going to happen with Nintendo 64. And the great thing here is that because the chip is so powerful, it's going to be able to play any Nintendo 64 game at full speed. This is also where that analog stick focus design is going to come into play. 
because having the analog stick up top for most PS1 and Nintendo 64 games is actually going to be a really good experience. And so I found with these systems in particular, I really enjoyed the 4x3 experience here. Now when it came to Sega Saturn, it was a similar experience but not quite perfect. I did find that I preferred to use the Yabasan Shiro Core within RetroArch rather than the standalone emulator. And that mostly has to do with having universal hotkeys, but then also, you know, the emulator doesn't work very well with Daichisho either. And so anytime I could get full speed, I preferred to use the RetroArch Core instead. And for most games, they are going to play at full speed, which is going to give you a really great Sega Saturn experience. However, there are going to be some games that aren't going to play at full speed. I would say maybe the 10% top tier of Sega Saturn won't play fully. And so some games like Virtua Fighter 2 and Sega Worldwide Soccer 97, they're just going to be a little bit sluggish, not a perfect experience. And other games like Last Bronx were so slow that I wouldn't really consider this to be playable. Now, unfortunately, when using the standalone emulator, I did get full speed, but I was having some graphical issues. And so overall, I would say this chipset is probably not ready for playing 100% Saturn games altogether, but most games are going to play pretty well. Now, moving over to Dreamcast, this one actually emulates a lot better than Sega Saturn, and so because of that, I would expect to play all games at full speed. And this experience is going to be very similar to Nintendo 64, where all the games look really good at their native aspect ratio, and you can play them at their full resolution. It's not going to be the same like on a Retro Pocket 3 Plus where you can upscale it. Instead, it's going to be a more authentic or original experience. And that'll really come down to you and your own personal preferences. Now, another system that can play at full speed is going to be Sony PSP. For this, I recommend using a 2x resolution because even though it can play to 3x, you won't see it in this low resolution display. And because the PSP was a 16x9 system, the display itself is going to look a little bit squished. But at least from a performance standpoint, yes, you can play PSP on this device as well. Now, one trend I've seen over the past year is that everyone wants to know how GameCube and PS2 is going to work on these handhelds. And that actually leads into my first of three reasons why you may want to avoid the RG405M. And that is that I personally feel that this handheld is not a PS2 or GameCube device. So let's talk about why I feel this way. Number one, you will be able to play some GameCube and PS2 games on this handheld, but it will not be a plug and play experience. For example, for the best results, I recommend using the PAL versions of these games. For GameCube and PS2, if you try to play the PAL version of the game, it often will give you the option of playing it at 50 frames per second. And that's going to give the hardware a little bit of a boost to be able to get to full speed. So already, if you do not have PAL versions of all these games, you will have to rebuild your ROM library to get this working. After that, it's going to come down to what some consider to be a dirty word, and that is tinkering. Honestly, there are two different camps of people out there in the emulation world. To start, there's going to be people who just want to play these games right from the get-go. So ideally, they can just drop the ROM into their emulator and start playing right away. And honestly, I actually prefer this as well. I like the idea of starting up a game and just playing it like that. And the more powerful your system is, the higher the likelihood that's going to happen. Now there's another group of people who actually enjoy tinkering. It's almost like a fun challenge, where you have a game that's initially not working perfectly, but if you go into the settings and move over a couple random knobs, sometimes you can get it to work. And between those two, when it comes to GameCube and PS2, I would say the Amernic RG405M is a tinkerer's device. Because yes, you can get about half of the PS2 and GameCube games to work if you use the PAL versions and if you mess around with the settings. And you'll even find some people who are a little bit more enthusiastic, where they can say that most games will play, like 75%, 80% if you tinker around enough. And like I mentioned, it all comes down to personal preference, but for me personally, I found that the juice really wasn't worth the squeeze. The fact that I have to play a 50Hz version of this game and then also spend just as much time messing with the settings as actually playing the game, to me that's not a very good time. In fact, I found it kind of frustrating when doing all my testing. And so if you're the type of person to find that frustrating as well, then you may not enjoy playing GameCube or PS2 on this device. And no matter what you do, there will be some games that aren't going to run at full speed. Twilight Princess is a good example here. Now, before we move over to PS2, let's take a quick cat break. If you're new to this channel, this is my cat chicken right here. She doesn't really care about GameCube or PS2, but she does like sitting on people's laps. And it just so happens that I was doing this testing at like 3 in the morning, and so there were no other laps around. And so she jumped up here, we had a good cat break, and then decided to move on. So let's go ahead and move over to PS2 next. Here I'm using the Aether SX2 emulator, and I'm also using PAL versions of the ROMs when possible, and I've set everything up with the fast preset. This is going to give it a moderate underclock, which can affect the overall feel of the game, but often will make many of these games play at close to full speed. And much like with the GameCube footage that I was showing earlier, it's really going to come down to your own personal preference. Because it is possible to jump into here, mess around with the settings, and get some pretty good gameplay. But again, this won't be a magic bullet where every single game is going to play well. 
When it comes down to it, this is the way I look at it. If you're really picky about some of the older systems, like Dreamcast or Nintendo 64, then yes, this is going to be a good fit right here because all those games are going to play at full speed. However, if you're picky about GameCube and PS2, for example, you have one or two specific games you really want to play well, then maybe the RG405M is not going to be a good fit. Personally, I like to think of it like an added bonus, where you can play all the things like Dreamcast and Nintendo 64 absolutely fine, and then maybe if you're lucky, there will be a PS2 and GameCube game that you want to play that'll work well here too. However, I'm not comfortable saying that this is a GameCube or PS2 friendly device. Honestly, at this point, if you want a device that can play GameCube and PS2 reliably for under $200, it just doesn't exist yet. But chances are we might see something like that before the end of the year. Now, there are a couple other high-end systems that will work relatively well on this device. Same thing here where I would consider them to be bonus systems. But for example, if you wanted to try Nintendo 3DS, there are going to be some games that play really well. For this, I'm using the new Vulcan version of Citra, and this is not an official release yet, but if you go into their Discord, you can find it pinned within their messages. You're also going to have similar results with the Skyline emulator for Nintendo Switch. And this will only really play the most lightweight games, so things like indie games. But there's some really good games out there, like SteamWorld Dig 2 or Celeste, that you can play on this chipset at a relatively full speed. Again, I would consider this to be an added bonus. Okay, next let's talk about the second reason why you may want to steer clear of the RG405M. And that comes down to some of the limitations within its software. We're going to talk about Android gaming here in this next section. And after spending a couple weeks testing a variety of games, I found that the results are kind of mixed when it comes to Android games. Some games like Beach Buggy Racing will scale to 4x3 and they look really great. Others, like Rigid Force Redux, actually goes to a native 16x9 and so it looks a little bit small. However, the most frustrating part was that some games that have controller support did not actually work with the controller. For example, I like to play this game called Oddmar on my Odin and it works really well, but here on the 405M it doesn't register any of the buttons. And probably the most frustrating one is that the Xbox Game Pass app does not register the L2 and R2 inputs. And that will absolutely cripple many games. For example, with Forza Horizon 5, you can't step on the gas to actually drive. Or with a first-person shooter game, you can't actually shoot your gun. And so it's almost futile to even try playing Xbox on this device. And this has to do with the way that the controller is mapped within the Android build that Ambernick has made. But also to be perfectly honest, given the inline shoulder buttons that we have up here on top, it's not really fun to play with the triggers anyway. If you want to do some game streaming on this chipset, I would definitely recommend the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus because it has stacked shoulder buttons, also a 16x9 aspect ratio display, and all of the buttons register correctly. If you want an even better streaming experience, I would recommend the Odin Lite. This one's actually only $20 more than the RG405M, but it has a nice big display as well as some ergonomic grips and analog triggers. And that combination makes it really great for streaming. For example, with Forza Horizon 5, you can use the analog trigger to get a very nuanced input with the gas. In the end, I would say the Android build on the 405M mostly works. For example, it has Google Play Store support, and there are going to be quite a few Android games that do work well. But it is frustrating when you have a game that's supposed to work with controls and it doesn't, or the fact that you can't do proper game streaming either. And finally, the third reason why the RG405M may not be the best fit for you is because there are so many other alternatives out there. And honestly, this is kind of a problem that Ambernick themselves created. For example, if you go over to the Ambernick website, you will see over a dozen handhelds that they have released over the past couple years. And so already, just within the Ambernick space, there are so many other options to choose from for varying prices and performance. And this company is only one of many that have created retro handhelds. For example, we have several different options from Retroid as well. Along those same lines, if we go to the Powkitty website, you can see there are dozens of different options here. And these all vary in price and performance as well. And additionally, we have three different Odin models we can choose from from AYN. And don't even get me started on the various Loki models that they've announced as well. These were supposed to start shipping like six months ago, and we still haven't seen any of these products in the wild. And don't even get me started on the Mio Mini. This thing is perpetually out of stock, but also very popular too. In the end, my point here is this. The Ambernick RG405M is easily the best small handheld they've ever made. After it's been set up, you have a really nice user interface to be able to navigate to your games, launch them up, and it has the power to be able to play a lot of different systems. However, I would say it's only really worth buying if it's a perfect match for your specific use case. Say, for example, you would prefer the elegance of using a Linux-based firmware. In that case, I would recommend something like the RG353M instead. This one has the same aluminum shell and thin design. 
And while it does have a slightly smaller screen and a slower chip, it still does most of the same stuff that the 405M can do. On the flip side, if you want something with a larger screen and maybe stack shoulder buttons, I would say the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus is maybe going to be a good bet too. This one's actually $25 cheaper than the RG405M, but has the exact same chip inside with a better screen. And another example would be the Odin Lite. This one's only about $20, $30 more expensive than the 405M, but it has a much bigger screen and also a better Wi-Fi chip, which makes it great for streaming. And it's got some nice bells and whistles as well, including those stacked analog triggers and some ergonomic grips. It also has a beefier chipset that's going to allow you to play more PS2 and GameCube games. In fact, for most of these, you won't have to do things like fiddle around with settings or use the PAL versions of ROMs. In the end, because there are so many different options out there and different variables to them, I decided to make this slide right here, which I'm calling the RG405M Buying Role-Playing Game. What we're going to do here is start with zero hit points. Then I want you to read through each of these different options. There's eight for each side. And if any of these apply to you, then you're going to check the box. And if you do it on the red side, then you're going to lose a hit point. If you do it on the green side, you're going to gain one. And the idea here is that if you are still alive at the end of this game, that you have either zero or more hit points, then I think the RG405M is going to be a device that might be worth considering. Now, if you have a lot of hit points, then I think it's even more of a consideration. But if you're closer to zero, then you might want to hang back. Either way, let me know your score in the comments below because I'm always interested to see how these things play out and what kind of notes you're going to get. In the end, that's really about it for this video. Yes, the Amronic RG405M is the best device that they've made in a small form factor like this. But sometimes the best device that Amronic has made isn't going to be the best one for you. For example, at about $175 to $180, this may not be within your budget. In that case, you might want something a little bit cheaper. You also might think that metal devices are a little bit too heavy, and I'm also in that camp too. I really hope they make a plastic version of this specific device in the future. Either way, when it comes down to it, yes, this is a great device, and it's particularly good when it comes to playing things like Nintendo 64 or Dreamcast. I love the idea of playing these games in their native resolution and at the native aspect ratio. And with a nice 4-inch display like this, it looks very impressive. All the same, I can't help but think that the next Ambernick device that comes out, and that might be in a month or six, will be even better than this. So let me know what you think in the comments below, both your role-playing game score, but then also whether or not you think this is the one to get, or if you're going to wait for something else. As always, thank you for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.